The imaginative element in the character of the Celtic race naturally predisposes them to the reception and retention of fanciful ideas in connection with our relations to the unseen. Keenly sensible of the existence of supernatural influences, they are morbidly curious as to the mode in which they act upon humanity and ever desirous to propitiate or guard against them. There is something in the presence of the sea and the mountains which fosters a habit of reverie, and the mind, awed and perplexed by the vastness of the forces of nature, is led to give them an actual and definite embodiment and to associate them directly with the incidents of our mortal life. Granted the existence of invisible creatures, there is no reason why humans who look upon the universe as a circle of which we are the center should not suppose them to be interested in all that interests us. And when this is once admitted, it follows as an inevitable result that we will endeavor to make them the agents of our inclination or will, unless we fear them as powers whose anger must be reverently deprecated. It will be found that most of the popular superstitions to which we refer are based upon these motives, that most of them originate in the desire to bribe and cajole fortune, or to command and defeat it. Others will be found to have had their rise, as we have hinted in the feelings of awe and wonder, awakened by the mystery or the grandeur of nature. The wail of waters against a rocky coast has suggested the cries of the ocean maiden who seeks to lure the mariner to his destruction. The wreathing mists floating in fantastic shapes across the mountain valleys has peopled their depths with a world of spirits or friendly or inimical to mortals. The imagination, which has been quickened by nature, proceeds in turn to breathe into nature a new life. It was on Halloween or All Hallows Eve that superstition ran riot, because on that particular evening, the supernatural influences of the other world were supposed to be specially prevalent, and the power of divination was likewise believed to be at its height. Spirits then walked about with unusual freedom and readily responded to the call of those armed with due authority. In the prehistoric past, the Druids at this time celebrated their great autumn fire festival insisting that all fires except their own should be extinguished so as to compel men to purchase the sacred fire at a certain price. This sacred fire was fed with the peeled wood of a certain tree and that it might not be polluted was never blown with human breath. Needless to say that the sacred fire has vanished with the Druids, but the Halloween customs which still survive may be traced back to great antiquity. For instance, various kinds of divination may be practiced and chiefly with apples and nuts. Bobbing for apples is a relic of the old Celtic fairy lore. When you have caught one, you peel it carefully and pass the long strip of peel thrice sunwise round your head, after which you throw it over your shoulder and it falls to the ground in the shape of the initial letter of your true love's name. Children born on Halloween were formerly supposed to be gifted with certain mysterious endowments such as the power of perceiving and conversing with the dwellers on the threshold, the inhabitants of the world invisible. Once upon a time, all over Scotland, a bonfire was lighted on every farm, and often the bonfire was surrounded by a circular trench, symbolical of the sun. Every year these bonfires decrease in number, but within the recollection of living witnesses, no fewer than 30 could be seen on the high hilltops between Dunkeld and Abergeldy, and a strange weird sight it was, worthy of the pencil of a Rembrandt, the dusky figures of the lads and lasses dancing wildly around them to the hoarse music of their own voices. The balefires, as the people call them, still blaze as brightly as ever, and from personal observation we can assert that they are still lighted in many parts of Britain,